Okay, so so far we've taken a look at the bonds that hold molecules together. Those are the intramolecular bonds. These are going to be the intermolecular bonds, and the word inter always means between. So in an international flight, you're going between countries. So these are things that are going to hold different molecules close to each other, and it's going to lead to all sorts of neat properties, such as the uh, meniscus that you're familiar with for measuring a graduated cylinder or a thermometer, and even the, the Jesus lizard, so-called, that can walk or run on top of water. And that's exactly what it looks like as we go. Okay, so the first type of intermolecular force is a, is a van der Waals force, and that's the way we pronounce it, van der Waals, it's another German-Dutch pronunciation, where we've got a positively charged nucleus, of course, with our electrons distributed around the outside. Now, at any one particular point in time, some of those electrons, just by their movement, might end up being sort of congregated just by chance at one particular side of the atom. So what we would have as a result is an area of an, of an atom where we have, just for a, a temporary period of time, we've got a positive charge going on here, and we've got a negative zone sort of on the back side of this particular nucleus. So if we can then bring in another atom, what we would have is, we would have, even if it's relatively evenly distributed here, we would have some attractions ending up happening between these two atoms because we've got the negative regions being attracted towards that positive area and vice versa. So that's going to bring those two things together. And even though we've used the example of atoms here, it's just to simplify it, this is going to happen between regions of molecules as well. And the van der Waals forces are also uh, involved in the dipole to dipole interactions. It's the same type of idea that Paula Abdul chemistry where like charges repel and opposites attract. Now you might think these van der Waals forces don't really have any real big implication. Well, if we take a look at this this lizard here, this is a gecko, um, you know, very small type of lizard, climbs up walls. It can actually climb up walls and defeat gravity. And the reason this works is because when you look at its little feet here, each of these toes has what looks like sort of frills or fringes or bumps of skin. And when you zoom in on those in an electron micrograph, you see they have all these short little hair structures with little frills at the end those little frills at the end actually work and hold and help the gecko stick to surfaces and to free gravity by forming temporary transient van der Waals forces with the surface and because there's so many of them they're forming and reforming it acts a little bit like a suction cup there's no actual suction going on it's all these temporary transient attractions between atoms on these little hairs on its paws, if you will, and the surface that it's on. Now, the best application of uh, van der Waals forces that we can give you to the real world, something you might have experienced, would be the gecko lizard. You know, small lizard seems to climb up walls and stick to surfaces, and a lot of people would probably think it's got suction cups on its on its feet and, and legs. It, it doesn't have suction cups. What it has instead, and when you look at it under electron micrograph, are all sorts of little frills and ridges, and it's we would think it's for grip, and it is for grip, but just in a completely different way. There's no hooks or anything there. Each one of those little frills looks like this, where you've got all these stalks with all these little teeny tiny hairs, and those hairs provide attachment points and surface area for all these tiny van der Waals forces to be constantly being made and remade on top of these surfaces, and it actually helps that gecko in some ways defeat gravity. Now for our next type of intramolecular force, we have to go back and take a special look at that special molecule known as water, where we've got an oxygen atom with six valence electrons bonded to two hydrogen atoms. And we have to remember, of course, that our hydrogen atoms here are going to have a slight positive charge on them because it's got the lower electronegativity, and this bond in here is a polar covalent bond. So that means the electrons spend more time around the more electronegative atom than the other. So we always need to remember that water is a charged particle. So when we look at hydrogen bonds, the second type of intermolecular force, we've got two basic requirements. And the first one is going to be having a hydrogen atom, just like in water, bonded covalently, so a shared pair of electrons, to oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine. And that works because those oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine atoms are very electronegative, so it almost ensures you the fact that you're going to get this dipole action on hydrogen. 
Next thing we're going to need is a lone pair of electrons. Now, this is not a pair of electrons. It needs to find e, e harmony. We'll show you what we mean by a lone pair of electrons in a minute here, or a second, I guess. So what we mean by a lone pair of electrons is, we'll go back to water here. And we've got our oxygen with its six valence shell electrons in our Lewis diagram. And our two covalently bonded hydrogens with their dipoles. And what we mean by lone pairs are these two pairs of electrons sitting up here. Okay, those are our, our lone pairs. So water molecule happens to have two lone pairs with those two hydrogen dipoles sitting around it. Now water isn't the only molecule that can do the uh, hydrogen bonding trick for something like methane or sorry ammonia gas you'd have nitrogen with its five valence electrons and it's going to bond to three hydrogens and they're going to have dipoles too and then we've got of course one lone pair sitting right there now of course hydrogen bonds don't occur inside a water molecule or inside an ammonia molecule, what they do is they occur between different particles. So if we look at this water molecule, what it means is if we were to put ammonia and water together, these molecules are going to spin around so that those lone pairs of electrons end up having an attraction towards those positive hydrogen dipoles. And if you can imagine a whole bunch of these molecules being together and vibrating back and forth, it means that we're going to have you know, a lone pair of electrons attached and sometimes attracted to more than one hydrogen atom on a dipole of another molecule. So you'll have lots of these being formed and in some cases if it's a gas or a liquid reformed as well. Now just to give you an idea of another molecule would have a lone pair would be something like methane gas. So there's carbon and in methane it's CH4 so we're gonna have four hydrogen atoms around that carbon and now we've got a hydrogen atom bonded and it's not bonded covalently it's whether it is or not we don't have any lone pairs of electrons so methane gas can't possibly hydrogen bond to any of these other two molecules it's not allowed now hydrogen bonding is a pretty neat concept and it's its strength in terms of its usability happens because of the number so their weak bonds are weak dipole to dipole attractions that occur but you can imagine in a, a solid water molecule like ice those hydrogen bonds become fixed and set much like a crystal does with an ionic bond but when you have liquids and, and gases where the molecules are moving around quite quickly you're going to have these hydrogen bonds being formed and reformed with some regularity when you put a bunch of these together it's going to give you some pretty special properties that we're going to talk about when we go to learning about water in our next lesson